today on an all-new Dr. Phil. She's 22 years old. If she's not the center of attention, she will throw a tantrum. And her stepsister just asked her to be a bridesmaid. She said, I understand it's her special day, but I don't understand why it all has to be about her. On her wedding day, I think some people should pay attention to me. She's she telling you what she's going to do. You're going to blow this thing up, right? Let's do it. Why don't we stop all the drama, stop all the fighting, and let's go get you better. Here we go. Have a good show, everybody. If I can help get this family back on track, are you willing to do that? Ready, free. Take. This is going to be a changing day in your life. Go, Dr. Phil. Well, 22-year-old Caitlin is a criminal justice major in college and is looking forward to being a bridesmaid in her stepsister's upcoming wedding. Two aspects of her life that seem pretty normal, right? Yeah. Just no big deal. But her mother is so concerned about Caitlin that she sent this home video capturing what life with her daughter is really like. Let's go in the house. We'll get your medicine. And you'll feel a lot better, okay? Come on. No, 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 no. Why do you want to stay out here? Guys, I don't want to move. Run it off. Come on, just take your medicine. No. Here's your water. Go away. The medicine isn't going to make it better. It might make it better. No, it won't. Well, Kim says her daughter's persistent meltdowns have caused chaos in the house and has really divided the family. Now, Caitlin's stepfather, Ross, well, he's just frustrated. And he suspects that Caitlin is overplaying these episodes simply because she just craves attention. Take a look. My daughter Katie's behavior is out of control. Anything can trigger a meltdown. When I am around Katie, I am afraid to say what I want to say because I don't know how she's going to react. <laughs> it's like flipping a light switch. Caitlin can be having a normal day. <laughs> then 30 seconds later, be in a total meltdown. She's 22 years old, but she acts like a child having a temper tantrum. I think they don't understand me. The meltdowns are completely out of my control. <laughs> it's like a roller coaster. It's like an out-of-body experience. No, no. I have no control over my body, uh, my screaming, <laughs> my crying, my anger. I have no control over it. I am tired of catering to Caitlin, especially when she's being unreasonable. My fear is that there's something seriously wrong with Katie. Ross thinks that Caitlin will pretend she's having anxiety in order just to be lazy. Caitlin definitely knows how to play the lazy card. It really upsets me that Ross thinks Caitlin is trying to play us. It's insane to think that I would go to such lengths to throw myself on the ground and cry and scream and humiliate myself if it wasn't out of my control. Go away! I don't believe Caitlin's lazy. I think she's just depressed. My greatest fear is that nobody will ever know what's wrong with me and I'll have to live like this for the rest of my life. Go away! Uh, we saw some footage of you uh, kind of yelling and screaming and seemingly just throwing a tantrum. What do you, have you seen that footage? I have not. Okay, let me, let's play the first footage of the home camera that you sent to us uh, of, of you in the car. Let's take a look at this. <laughs> Let's go in the house. We'll get your medicine. And you'll feel a lot better, okay? Come on. No, 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 no. Why do you want to stay out here? Guys, I don't want to move. Run it off. <laughs> Come on, just take your medicine. No. Here's your water. Go away. The medicine isn't going to make it better. It might make it better. No, it won't. Do you recall this? Um, I don't really remember it. Like, I mean, it was kind of just like this huge shock, and I was just beyond stressed out and just like, I lost it. So I really don't remember any of it. Do you remember what triggered this? Um, a breakup between me and my, my ex-boyfriend. Uh, you and your ex-boyfriend? Yeah. Why did you guys break up? Um, because of the way I am. He just, he couldn't take it anymore. Yeah. And when he broke up with you, did you do that with him? 
Oh, no, I was at home. Okay. Yeah. Because that would do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, he, he's well, seen that, though. A little bit of it. Um, he's seen, like, anxiety attacks where yeah. well, I don't know What do you think about when you see yourself doing that? It's kind of hard to believe that's me. Yeah. Well, what do you think about it? I think that she doesn't have any control over it. I think that she would uh, would rather be different, that her life was different and she was different. And um, I think that um, she wishes that she could find a way to, to live normally. So you think she has no control over it at all? I think she has absolutely no control over it. Wow. Uh, does that insult you for her to say that? No. Because God, that it's... would insult me something <laughs> terrible. I thought, what a condescending thing to say about a child. Do you really have that little confidence in this woman? It's not that I don't have confidence in her. It's just that... It's been 22 years of, of, of being with Katie and just getting to know her and, and talking to her and, and asking her, and, and even she tells me that she doesn't have any control over it. I mean, that's really what I got it from, because I've tried to work with her and say, next time this happens, you know, stop yourself. Do you need for her to be dependent on you? Absolutely not. What I want for her is to be independent, to go back to school. Do you need for her to be out of control? Because you seem to nurture that. I'm, I'm sorry, but you do. I do. You, you, you I, seem to nurture yeah. that. And I'm, I'm looking, I've watched this whole dynamic, and I'm thinking, this connection here is really sick. It is. Truth is, neither one of us want it this way. Oh, I disagree. I disagree. You apparently want it this way very much because you both work at it very consistently. And I'm just wondering why. It's mostly for me, it's out of fear that if I don't stay so connected with her and so on top of her, that she's very destructive and reckless and, and makes poor decisions that if I don't keep tabs on her and keep track of her that something really bad's gonna happen. So you're afraid? I'm afraid. Okay, so you do this to make yourself feel better? Uh, also, I do it, true, I do. I do it to make myself feel better, but I also do it to protect her so that she doesn't get into something where she's in over her head and can't handle it. Because okay, she gets so, herself into the Well, that's situation. interesting insight. I mean, maybe that's, that's the first time I've heard you say that. So you're actually doing what you do in, in, it's beyond enabling her, you're sabotaging her, but you're actually doing that because it makes you feel better. That is you don't even reasons. have an illusion of it making her better, you're doing it because it makes you feel better. That's very selfish, actually. It's, Could it's mom true. be enabling this behavior and actually be part of the problem is obviously the big question. Take a look at this tape and we'll talk about it. Katie has become one of my 24-7 priorities. Your homework done? Kim has put on herself to help Caitlin run her life. When Katie's melting down, <laughs> I'm always the one that has to calm Katie down. I'll call my mom, begging her to help me, come get me. I'm always used to my mom being there, always taking care of me. I call and check on Katie constantly. She can be very irrational. I'm an adult. I can go to school without her calling me 500 times. If I don't check on Caitlin, I tend to worry a lot that, that something may be going wrong that I could prevent. If Katie's having a bad day, I want Ross just to back off and leave her alone. I want to handle it in a more heavy-handed manner. She definitely lets Caitlin slide. When my dad gets involved, it gets way worse. I enable Katie. It's easier to give in to Katie than deal with the drama. She caters to me a lot. I never really have to be responsible. Enabling Katie does not help anything. It makes it worse. I often wonder if I might be part of the problem. Did you hear what she said? Yes. I enable her. That's true. That isn't what then she I, said. She said, I never have to be responsible. Because I take care of her and I tell her exactly what she needs did, to do did every you, day. And did yeah, you hear that? I did hear that. And, and you, you know that, right? Yeah. And, yeah. But you tell him to shut up and get out of this. You're making this worse. You're trying to make her better, but it upsets her because he's messing up your playhouse. You, what do you guys think about what I'm saying here? <laughs> well, obviously, I agree with what you're saying. I mean, that has been my position all along. But you're the stepfather here. True. And so that makes it difficult for you to be a primary mm. director here. All you can do is kind of support her. What are you thinking about all this conversation? You gotta be hating this. I just feel bad because like, it just seems like, you know, my parents are blamed for everything and I should be the one to stand up and be like, hey, I don't need you to do this for me anymore. You know, I'm 22 years old. I can, you know, clean my room. I can, you know, I can get myself up in the morning. I don't, you know, need you. I don't need my parents to help me at 22 years old. But if they don't, I don't, I, I don't get up early. I don't have my room clean. And it's, it's just, it's, it's hard because you're stuck in the middle of it between wanting to and knowing that you don't have to. You want to, but you know you don't have to. But where do you come down on the question as to whether you can or not? 
Um, I mean, of course, necessity is the mother of invention, so I guess you've never really had to, so you really don't know yet. Yeah. Okay, well, let's take a break. Caitlin's stepsister, Lexanne, is planning a big wedding in a few months. Uh, she worries that Caitlin could disrupt what's supposed to be the happiest day of her life. We'll be right back. On our wedding day, I think some people should pay attention to me because it's hard for me to watch my sister walk down the aisle when I should have done that first. I'm afraid that Katie might start screaming or yelling or hysterically bawling. My greatest fear about the wedding is just before Lexanne walks down the aisle, Caitlin has a meltdown and chaos ensues. And later... My OCD fear is contamination. One, two, three. I question if her OCD germ phobia is really true. Every time I do this, I think I can't do this anymore. Tomorrow on an all-new Dr. Phil. She kept saying, like he's not breathing, like he's not breathing. They lost their son. I just picked him up and he was gone. Then they discovered abuse. You find out that your own father has violated your daughter. With so much tragedy. You have screamed at him that he is not grieving right. There's no right or wrong way to grieve. Can their marriage be saved? I don't want my marriage to fall apart. I already lost enough. That's tomorrow. I am currently planning my wedding. One of the biggest concerns about my wedding is Katie. She asked me the other day if I would be a bridesmaid. My concern is that she'll have a meltdown or she'll try to make herself the center of attention. I understand it's her special day, but I don't understand why it has to be revolved around her. I mean, she's getting married really young. On her wedding day, I think some people should pay attention to me because it's hard for me to watch my sister walk down the aisle when I should have done that first. I'm afraid that Katie might start screaming or yelling or hysterically bawling. I know I'm going to lose it when Lexanne's bossy and just has to be in charge of everything. Go away! She's very immature. I have not seen a 22-year-old ever throw herself on the ground in a tantrum. It's unbelievable. My greatest fear about the wedding is just before Lexanne walks down the aisle, Caitlin has a meltdown and chaos ensues. It is absolutely possible. Are, are you going to blow this deal up? I don't want to. I mean, I've taken... Ooh. That wasn't a question. I didn't say <laughs> you want to blow it up. I said, are you going to blow it up? I hope not. Oh. <laughs> uh, see, I think... Let, let me tell you. See, I th I've got this theory that if people will just listen... Folks will tell you what they're going to do. And I think you've already said three times before, now five with these two, what you're going to do. I, I pulled some clips out of that wedding video. Here's clip number one. Take a listen to this. I understand it's her special day, but I don't understand why it has to be revolved around her. I understand it's her special day, but... Now, but is a real big word for me. But means forget everything I just said. I'm now going to tell you what I really think. I understand it's her special day, but forget all of that. I don't understand why it all has to be about her. What about me, right? I mean, that's what you really think, true? Yeah, no way. Well, that's what you said. Yeah. Okay, then I pulled another clip from this. She's telling you, listen to this one. On our wedding day, I think some people should pay attention to me because it's hard for me to watch my sister walk down the aisle when I should have done that first. Okay, so as opposed to being happy for her, people should be paying attention to you instead of her walking down the aisle because it should have been you first. If you listen, she's telling you what she's going to do. Right. Okay, and then there's a third clip that I think kind of is her summary statement. Let's listen to that. I know I'm going to lose it when Lexanne's bossy and just has to be in charge of everything. Yes, I will be. I Dad. know I'm going to lose it. Now, those three statements taken as a group are pretty compelling. So you've already decided you're going to lose it. 
Because she is going to be bossy, right? I mean, it's going to be her day, and she's going to want things the way she wants it, and you consider that to be bossy, instead of her just saying, this is my one day that I get to be queen for a day. And that's offensive to your sensibilities, isn't it? Because it means it's all about her, which means it's none about you, which is something you just cannot abide. True? True. So you predict you're going to blow this thing up, right? <laughs> uh, what part of that do you not understand? I mean, I understand it. It doesn't make me change my decision on wanting her in the wedding. She, I still love her, you know, and I really do want her to be a part of it. But I don't want her to have a meltdown either before I'm supposed to go out to walk the aisle. Okay, so you're willing to trade your wedding for her to have a stage to behave with this ridiculous behavior? Unfortunately, yes. Wow, you're as sick as she is. <laughs> you, you have these people mesmerized. You We've agreed you're doing this for you, not for her. You realize this isn't making her better. I, no, I think I do it for a couple of reasons. Do I you do. think it's making her better? No, it's just a day, it's, it's not a, a long-term fix. It's just a day-to-day, -day, get through a day. Days turn into weeks, weeks turn into months. And months they turn, turn into, into 22 years, years Dr. Phil. And so this, this short-term fix, come on. You, you've now got a deeply entrenched pattern here with a 22-year-old that has not developed coping skills. She has not had the opportunity to observe herself mastering her environment. She has not learned the activities of daily living necessary to mature and evolve as an independent woman. But you've gotten over your anxiety each day because you feel like, well, I'm, I'm taking care of her. I'm, 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 doing, I'm doing these things. I still, I still have anxiety every day. It's, it's Well, but you get yourself a little fix. A, a small, small. Right, a very small fix. Let's take a break. We're going to find out why Caitlin says she needs to completely rearrange the furniture in her bedroom, keeps a spreadsheet documenting what she needs to do each hour of the day. She's gotten to the point that she finds some comfort in doing tedious things like rearranging beads and going through things that sound an awful lot like obsessive compulsive thoughts and behaviors to try to control her world, which seems to be moving in the wrong direction, not the right direction, but we'll be right back. Katie needs to know that we love her and we care about her, and we're willing to do anything, you know, that we need to. But she also has to step up. She also has to be accountable. Something's blocking her from doing that. I don't know what that is, but that's what we got to figure out. I can't control my behavior or my emotions, so the one thing that I can control is how I spend my time. I make spreadsheets to plan out my day, hour by hour, starting with the time that I wake up in the morning to the time I go to bed. The problem is that the schedules are so detailed that she can't even follow them. If I'm not able to keep the schedule, my whole day will be ruined. I move furniture around my room so that I can control my physical surroundings. Katie has an obsession with beads. They're like microscopic seed beads. These are my beads. I sort them all by group, and then once they're in their own personal group, I sort them out by color. I sort the beads because it helps me to control things physically with my hands. When I first started organizing everything, I felt like it was helping me, but as I look at it, if I can't organize something, I will have a complete meltdown. No, 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 no. In this conversation, I've been very direct with you. I've kind of called you on being manipulative, uh, being pretty tyrannical, um, using this to control people, uh, planning to blow up your sister's wedding, um, you know, all, all types of things, um, which by content, not demeanor, are 
are pretty confrontive, and you've maintained your composure very well. Uh, how do you explain that? I'm just good at, you know, biting my tongue sometimes. Uh -huh. Sometimes. <laughs> you know, how do you feel about what I'm saying to you? Do you think I'm reading this right? Do you think I know what I'm doing? I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> no, you can tell me. I, I won't throw a tantrum. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not... I'm not, I'm not wanting to ruin my sister's wedding in the way that you think. Um, I was engaged for like two and a half years, and so, and it was my first love, and it was really hard to get over, and I just want somebody to be like, you know, we understand that this is hard for you, because you're so close to walking down the aisle, too. I just want somebody to know that, you know, <laughs> that some things affect me differently than other people. Yeah. You act like that was a trigger day, though. That wasn't a, 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 the first day that all this broke down. I mean, this, this has been going on for years and years. That's just one other component of an entire lifetime of this. Well, I know, but I think that was a major component. I said earlier, I think necessity is the mother of invention. And somehow or another, you've given yourself permission to not require very much of yourself to move on to the next level and you have kind of been a co-conspirator in that I mean you're parenting out of guilt and fear it's different parenting Caitlin than it was parenting the other two because because you can get through to them because you can you can teach them you can and they can learn from their mistakes and you can and you can reason with them but with Caitlin it was never her entire life like that. It was a whole different child. And the other two aren't like that, and we parent, and I parent them yeah, the same God, way. You're so condescending about her. Um, I wish you wouldn't talk like that about her. That's a terrible way to talk about a child. They're all different. And whatever you want to say, you got to own a big part of this. It, Sorry. It is my fault because I don't know how to parent Caitlin. Do you want to get past all of this? Yeah. Because you really do need to require more of yourself. Because you said, you know, I'm not just a spoiled brat. There's a big part of you that is a spoiled brat. Here's the deal. She's 22. It's time you grow up. Now, I'll tell you what I'm willing to do for you. I'm willing to get you some help. I'm willing to get you some neurological scans so we can rule out whether or not you, in fact, are in a neurological loop that's causing you to have some OCD or causing you to have some type of, of, of blockage that's keeping you from moving forward with these tantrums, these meltdowns or whatever, and, and, and we'll find out if there's something that needs to be dealt with there. And then we'll give you some more coping skills to deal with what's going on with you. It's probably going to involve some biofeedback training. It's probably going to involve some very sophisticated relaxation training, which is more than what it sounds like. You can begin to manage yourself and your emotionality with some new coping skills. And you <laughs> are going to need to butt out and let this young woman begin to behave like a young woman. Seriously, you can love her, you can support her, you can be there when she falls, but you really need to get out of her way. You need to give yourself permission to forgive yourself. So, I mean, you went through a divorce. I mean, some things happened. She, ha she went through some things. We'll help her deal with that. I'll get her some professional help with that. You need to get out of her way. I will, thank I'm you. I'm serious. I'm serious. Do you want the help with this? Yes, thank you. It's time for you to get some coping skills, move on, and, and grow up. I'm not mad at you. I'm just saying it's time. And, and your mother won't tell you that, but I'm telling you that. All right, next, we're going to meet a young woman who admits she pretended she was blind for six weeks, faked getting struck by a car, all for attention. See, you're not so bad. <laughs> now her mother wonders if her latest issue is real or another made-up malady. We're going to talk to her next. I felt 
unloved. I wanted someone to notice me. I faked a story of excruciating stomach aches. I said I was blind. I took a steak knife, cut my body. I questioned everything Jenny tells me now. She cried wolf a few too many times. It's difficult to imagine why anyone would fake being blind for six weeks or lie about a stalker breaking into the house with a knife. But that is exactly what Jenny did, and she admits it, and a whole lot more. After my brother got cancer, I felt unloved, unwanted. I wanted someone to notice me. My childhood fantasy was to be so sick that I was gonna die. I saw it as I needed to be just like him to get her affection. When Jenny was in 10th grade, she began to act out. I said I was blind. I would dart my eyes around the room like I couldn't focus on one thing. I'd kind of look over here off to the side like I can hear you talking but I can't see your face. I was scared to death for her. I pretended for six weeks. I finally was busted. She was holding onto my arm because she couldn't see and all of a sudden she stopped and waved. There were some of her friends across the mall. I was miraculously healed. I faked a new story of excruciating stomach aches. I would crunch over and I'd rock back and forth and crying and begging for my mom. I took her to different doctors. The only option left was a colonoscopy and I wasn't afraid to go that far. They said there was nothing wrong and the symptoms suddenly disappeared. Jenny's lies became more dramatic. I lied about being hit by a car. She didn't believe me. There was no evidence. The next lie, if I told my mom I was being attacked, that she would comfort me. I took a steak knife, cut my body. I fell hook, line, and sinker for this story. The detectives knew from the start I was lying. When I found out that Jenny had actually cut herself, I was shocked. I still didn't stop lying. I faked seizures trying to get anyone's attention. I would start to stare off into space, and my breathing would start getting shallow. I might slump a little lower, make my body a little limper. Jenny is 31 years old, and sometimes I think she acts more like a 10-year-old. I question everything Jenny tells me now. She cried wolf a few too many times. Well, now Alice worries that her daughter may have a whole new lie, a germ phobia. Take a look. My OCD fear is contamination. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I use pure rubbing alcohol on my skin and in my hair. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. I'm unable to shower in under two hours. Three, two, three, three, two, four, two, five. It's hard to believe now if she's crying wolf again or not. I wonder if it's an act. I don't know if I would trust me. I question if her OCD germ phobia is really true. There are times I see her perform normal. Usually if someone tries to touch Jenny, she will pull away. I just don't know what to believe from her anymore. The rule to use the bathroom at my house is you have to take all your clothes off except for your undergarments so that nothing touches the toilets or the sink or the counter and gets dirty. When somebody flushed the toilet, everything went in the air. It's on this curtain, and I touched it. There's been times I've told her to knock the crap off. I feel dirty. I feel panic. I'm kind of waiting to hear Jenny confess that this is made up. I feel I need to get my hands washed. I think Jenny's behavior could be a cry for attention, but I think there is also a cry for help there. Every time I do this, I think I can't do this anymore. I just can't do it anymore. Okay, well, it's good to meet both of you. Uh, Why do you want to be here today? I want to be independent. I want my kids home. I want to be a mother to them, fix them dinner, let them have their friends over, be in their room, play with their toys. But you're not doing that. Mm-hmm. Why not? I can't. I'm in the position right now. I, do, I can't even take care of myself. I'm actually pretty much bedridden every day. I sit in my bed. I'm afraid to touch every anything. I don't even 
Going to the bathroom takes half an hour to 45 minutes. The rituals are just so, it's overbearing. I have, you know, take off your clothes, lay them here, go wash my hands. Just washing my hands could take 15 to 20 minutes. Then go back and I, I can't even dress myself. I have a roommate helping me dress myself and then spray myself off, spray off the clothes and and then you just sit there frozen in bed so that you don't touch anything and ruin what you just worked an hour to get accomplished. Mm -hmm. You have children? Yes. And uh, you won't let the children touch you? No. And, and you don't touch your children? No. You, you won't hug your children? No. And you won't let your children hug you? No. So when they come up to you, what do you, what do, you do? Um, I don't physically push them away, but I'll, I'll tell them, you know, like usually I'm in, in bed and I'll tell them the bed's clean, don't touch the bed. What do you think's on the bed? If they've been outside or touched something, then they are, they are dirty. And I want to keep my bed clean, keep me clean, and I don't want them to ruin it. Okay, now, you, you, you faked being blind. I did. Then you said you had stomach problems, went so far as to have a colonoscopy. I did. You, you said you were hit by a car? Yes. Why did you choose be, being hit by a car? Dramatic. I, yeah. I, I mean, I didn't, obviously my car was fine. It didn't have any damage to it, but I had, I wanted to say something that somebody would notice. You said you had a stalker. I did. And eventually you said they broke into your room. Yes. And cut through the screen with a knife and then cut you. Right. And you actually cut yourself. Yes. On your chest, right? Mm hmm Through your clothes? I cut the screen on the window, uh -huh. cut the curtain, cut my shirt, and put a, a cut on yeah. my chest. But you cut the screen from the inside. Right, which is how the police and the detectives yeah. kind of figured it out. Yeah. So the problem is you're not very good at this. <laughs> You don't know germ phobics, I do. No, I'm just, a I... real germ phobic would never shake another person's hand. You don't know where this has been. No, I don't. <laughs> Tomorrow on an all new Dr. Phil. They couldn't save their son. She kept saying, like he's not breathing. Now, can they save their marriage? Look him in the eye and tell him we are not going to quit on each other. That's tomorrow. You had a brother that was ill. Yeah. And got a lot of attention early on. And he got all the attention. I thought that's what it, it meant. That I, I had to be at risk of losing my life if I was going to get anything. Yeah. Huh. And, and you admit that, like, all the things you've done, you did it for attention, and it worked, right? Maybe for a few minutes. But it always kind of, it wasn't... It was like they were going through the motions, you know? Your child's sick, you take them to the doctor. But it was never, it was never the emotional sit down, hold me, things are gonna be okay, I'm worried. I don't, I don't remember ever being told that she was worried or concerned. It was just. Do, do you love your daughter? Yes, I do, very much. Yeah. Um, was your son the favorite? I suppose in a way he was. He was four years old when he was diagnosed with his, so he was a little kid mm -hmm. when he got his leukemia. So her perception is maybe accurate. He, he was a favorite at the time. I can see that, yes. Do you think you've kind of um, worked your way into this syndrome that you have now? I've questioned it, but it's, thank you. It's, <clears throat> it's gotten so far that I've canceled. I didn't even celebrate my birthday this year. Mm -hmm. I didn't go out. I didn't. I didn't go with my friends. I didn't. I didn't even go eat with my kids. I sat at home in my bed. And let me let me tell you something. Can, can I just kind of get to the point here? Yes. So I got some good news and some bad news. Okay. The, the bad news is you're not very good at this. <laughs>
<laughs> um, I, I've been doing this a long time. I, I've treated a lot of germ phobics that are debilitated, but yet you walked right down that runway and you shook my hand and didn't think a thing of it. You're not very good at this. My problem is that... See there? Um, there you go. You're shaking my hand and you sat right down. A self-respecting germ phobic would never shake my hand. It's not... I'm not afraid of germs. You can't explain it away. I'm telling you, you don't know germ phobics. I do. No, I'm just... A I'm, real germ phobic would never shake another person's hand. You don't know where this has been. No, I don't. <laughs> but I'm cataloging it. Huh? I keep note of everything that I touch. And in my, my dressing room right now as we speak, there's a bottle of beer rubbing alcohol. And when I go in there, I mean, I can save it and take it home to my kids and say, hey, I shook hands with Dr. Phil, but I'm going to go rub it off with rubbing alcohol. <laughs> yeah, I know. When I handed you that handkerchief and you put it right on your face. I already feel... <laughs> I feel that I'm living... Okay, I'm just I'm trying to... Don't, 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 no, I'm, not, I'm not upset, you, but I'm you, trying no, to... You can't win this argument. I'm just... I mean, really, I'm not arguing with them. I'm just pointing some things out. This is, this is the bad news part. There's some good news. Let me get to the good news. Would you like some good news? <laughs> Let me just tell you after the break. We're going to find out why Jenny's eight-year-old son is now living with Jenny's mom, Alice, and I'm going to give her some of the strangest sounding good news in the history of television. We'll be right back. I haven't hugged or kissed or held my kids' hands in over four months. And if they try to hug me, I tell my children that I'm clean and they're dirty. You can see a very hurt look come on their face when she puts her hands out and says, don't touch me. Her children are starting to act out, exhibit some of the same quirky things. Her son is very well trained to use hand sanitizer constantly. Jenny's rituals have kept him up late at night to where he doesn't get enough sleep so that he can perform at school. I don't feel that's an environment for him to live in. Jenny's eight-year-old son is living with me now. Giving my son to my mom was a huge example of how much this is affecting my life. I, I said there was some good news, and I said it was going to be maybe the strangest good news in the history of television. Right. And the good news is there's enough wrong with you that you don't need to make up stuff. <laughs> Okay, I, I told you that was, see, did you see her smile when I said that? You, and and I, I, I know you're smiling because you think it's funny to hear, but it's also smiling because it's probably a relief in some ways at some level. And what I'm telling you is, the good news is, I feel like I have a really good handle on what it is, and it's very treatable. That's good. Which means that we can get you better, and it isn't what you're presenting is. I don't think you're a germ phobic at all. I, I really don't. I, I don't think you're, you're, you're not even a very good fake germ phobic, but you, you're certainly not a real germ phobic. And I think what you're doing is you're so upset and you're so emotionally wrought inside that you're trying to find rituals or behaviors, anything that will address what you're feeling. And so you've cast about and found this. You, you found, well, maybe if I became hyper clean and hyper sensitive and hyper controlled and contained, maybe this would all go away or something, but it won't. That isn't it. I think you've invented this. Uh, in an effort to try to control what's really going on, but it isn't. So it's kind of fake and it kind of isn't. It, it feels real. But you're not very effective. I, I, it isn't lessening your anxiety. It isn't working for you. No. 
why don't, why don't we just decide that right now, as real as it feels, let's just assume that we're just going to find out what is real, and we're going to give you some things that you know are real, and we're going to cope with this very, very differently so we can get this family back together? Okay. Okay, can we do that? Wouldn't you feel better about that? Very much. All right, when we come back, I'm going to check in with Caitlin to make sure that this bridesmaid um, lets her sister be the boss on her wedding day. We'll be right back. Well, I want to thank all of our guests today. And I, you know, I said earlier that you always, if you have a family member that has begun to behave in ways that are inconvenient, meaning that they're disruptive to the normal flow of things, you always have the question, um, is this just manipulative behavior or is it mental illness? Because there's a real big difference in how you respond to that. And, you know, hopefully today we've talked a little bit about where that line is and it's not always a clear distinction. Um, Caitlin, how do you feel about everything that's happened here today? I feel really good about it. I want you to be able to look your sister in the eye before that wedding takes place and say, you know what? I've really gained some insights, I've really gained some understanding, and I'm going to cheer you on this day, and it is all about you, and when it's my turn, it's going to be all about me, and I'm going to have you standing with me as well. But you can trust me to be there for you on this day, and I want you to be able to do that and feel good about it and feel right about it. And I kind of got the feeling that that light bulb's come on over your head already. Yeah. But, I, but before that happens, I want you to know that you're going to be able to do that. Thank you. We've got a plan for you. And we've, we've got a plan for you. And I'll tell you what I, I want to do is I'm going to ask Dr. Lawless um, to see you. He is the director of the PNP Center uh, in Dallas, Texas, which does both diagnostic and treatment. They focus a lot on the neurological aspects as well as the coping skills. And so we're going to arrange for you to go to the PNP Center and have a full workup and evaluation. All right, go to drphil.com for more information about what to do when your household is constantly disrupted by cries for attention. And you can always find me on Twitter and Facebook. Thanks for being here. So long. Thanks, guys. See you. See you.